Good morning. <clears throat> it's good to be with all of you. I hope that you are doing well this morning. I appreciate everybody being here and especially to our guest. <clears throat> we are glad that you are with us. I normally say this and I hadn't had a chance the past couple of weeks uh, just simply because it slipped my mind, but to all of our guests, uh, we recognize that you could be anywhere you want to be uh, this morning. God gave everybody a brand new day full of opportunity and you as a guest have decided to be with us uh, and we are humbled. And we are encouraged that you are with us, and we hope that your time with us will be encouraging and it will be uplifting uh, for you, and that as the opportunity presents itself, <clears throat> that you will be back uh, with us. So I, last weekend, I know a lot of people have been saying thank you for, uh, to a lot of people who put uh, the, the marriage seminar together, and there were a lot of people that in, uh, surely contributed in a lot of ways, but one specific group contributed in more ways than one, uh, and we, they kind of just fall through the crack, but I at least want to highlight that three high schoolers and four middle schoolers gave most of their Saturday to serve and to take care uh, and help uh, within child care. And if you want to know who they are so that you can seek them out and give them a thank you, then you can just see me after the service or you want to email me or text me. Uh, but these young men and women did a great service for everybody. And without them, we wouldn't have been able, <clears throat> excuse me, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, to make it throughout the rest of the day. So they did a phenomenal job, uh, great attitude, and that's just a reflection of the homes that they come from and, and the values that their parents are instilling within them. And then tonight, uh, we as a congregation get to participate in a lot of good works throughout the year. The Lord opens up doors and we have opportunities to where we can really serve. We actually get to put flesh and bone uh, to the things that we believe. And uh, one of my favorites is what we're going to be able to do tonight. Uh, that is that we'll gather together, brief devotional, a prayer, a song, and then we'll go downstairs and we will put uh, holiday bags or Thanksgiving bags for children uh, from Fuller Elementary. And these are, we're going to put 60 bags together. We put 40 together last year. We're going to put 60 together uh, this year. This is always near and dear to my heart. A lot of it is because when my mother and I, it was just she and I, she had uh, just, just had recently become a single mother. I was about five or six. Uh, she was working two jobs and everything that she was earning was going to be able to put a roof over our head and then just simply pay the bills. Uh, if we didn't have the kindness, if she and I did not have the kindness of strangers, I don't know who they are, I don't know their names, but if they weren't kind enough to just simply give us food, we wouldn't have eaten. All of the money my mother was earning would have gone, again, just to other stuff, uh, was going to other stuff. So just simply people. Uh, here I am 40 years later. I don't know who they are, uh, but I surely know that the, that the Lord knows who they are and that he is aware of their kindness. A lot of us are going to go home in a few hours and we're going to be in homes of abundance. There are a lot of people who will go home who are in places that don't even have a home. Uh, and while we wish that we could do a whole lot more, this is an opportunity to be able to do what we can. So I'm always mindful of what Peter and John had to say to the uh, lame man in Acts. You know, he's, he's asking for all sorts of things, and they simply just say, what you're asking for we don't have, but what we do have we give to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we wish we could do more, and certainly the Lord will open up the opportunity, and uh, hopefully we have the eyes and the ears to see it. And we'll act upon it, whether it's structured or not. Uh, but tonight is an opportunity to put something together in the name of the Lord and to give to someone else. And perhaps just with a, a pack of crackers, a little cup of, of uh, vegetables or whatever it is that we have, uh, then we'll be able to give somebody for at least a few hours. They won't have to wonder where their next meal is coming from. So this is a great opportunity to be here tonight. So I hope that you'll come out and that you will do that for us. So we are in the season of thanksgiving and gratitude. I know that many of us are considering that. Uh, Paul is going to say something in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 uh, that he, he just simply gives a command by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He gives uh, an imperative. Give thanks in all circumstances. And then he just, just in case the command is not enough, he tells us that this is actually God's plan for us. That if we are followers of Christ, 
He takes us beyond just earthly plans and things that we want to hope and dream about and uh, maybe one day accomplish. He takes us beyond all of that and he goes to something greater and he goes to something deeper. That when it comes to God's plan for the Christian, it is to rejoice, it is to pray, and it is to give thanks. That his will for us, not just this week, not just for this month, but every day that he gives us, we are to be thankful. Full of gratitude, full of gratefulness, that all comes and stems from reflection. To remember that we are to live in the will of God, and that includes to be thankful. However, this is also concerning gratitude is going to be <clears throat> one of the, the uh, strongest commands given that will elicit from our heart and our mind a struggle. Some of us are struggling to be thankful. It's not that we're not grateful. It's not that we don't see. It's not that we are not experiencing blessings upon blessing. But perhaps this morning you are struggling. In whatever circumstance you find yourself or your family, you are struggling to give thanks. It's real. It's a real feeling. It can be a very deep reality. For some of us, we're struggling because there's going to be an empty chair for the first time around the table. Others of us are struggling because there has been an empty chair and we still haven't gotten used to it. Still others of us are struggling because of unnamed things that we're just carrying around in our heart and our mind. And I read the scripture, you may be thinking to yourself, I read the scripture, give thanks. And here, I know to do that. But here, it's falling behind a little bit. What do you do when you struggle to be thankful? What do you do when gratitude is hard to come by? Everybody else seems to be grateful. Everybody else seems to be doing well. And of course, we put on a show, so we shouldn't just judge that by the surface. But it is real hard for some of us to be thankful. It shouldn't be, but it is. So what do we do? The man who penned these words to the Thessalonian church is a man who knew a lot of circumstances. Sometimes they were really good circumstances. Sometimes when he went from city to city, he was welcomed. He was encouraged to continue to speak. He was encouraged to do good. He was encouraged to do a lot of things in the name of God, and he found it real easy. And then sometimes this man who wrote these words that you just see on the screen found himself in circumstances that, just to put it mildly, were less than favorable. But he found it, yes, by inspiration of the Spirit, but I'm sure he probably had a little bit of tossing to and fro when the Spirit lays it on him and he is, he is inspired to pen these words. I wonder if the Apostle Paul, after he wrote these words, put down his pen and just sat with it and reflected on the good, but also reflected on the bad. You want to know what kind of circumstances he found himself in, read the second letter to the Corinthian church. He'll talk about from an internal perspective, he was, he was pressed on every side. Sometimes he was fallen. Sometimes he was full of sorrow. On other occasions, from an ex external perspective, he was hungry. He was thirsty. And what we're going to look at this morning in Acts chapter 27 is that this man, this Apostle that we know, his name being Paul, was shipwrecked five times. And this morning we're going to look at one of those five. Now as Acts 27 opens up, Paul has been, he's been arrested and he has been working his way up the chain of command, if you will. He's appealed and appealed and appealed. Uh, he's defending himself, defending himself, and really he doesn't even defend himself. He uses the opportunity instead to share the gospel, to point to Jesus and to share Jesus and get those who are listening to make a decision, to move beyond their, their concepts of power, uh, their position, their prestige, and to see that they need God just as much as he is. And that truly the one that is in chains is not Paul, because in Christ he's free. 
The one who is in chains is the one who is still in their sin. So he uses the opportunity. Well, no one's listening, and he finally makes an appeal as a Roman citizen, Paul does, and that is he wants to appeal to Caesar. If no one else is going to make a decision about me, I want to make an appeal to Caesar. So everybody, one of the individuals says, to Caesar you have asked, I'm paraphrasing, to Caesar you have asked, to Caesar you will go. Well, they load him up on a ship with 200 other individuals. And they run into the teeth of a ferocious storm. It's really bad. I'd encourage you that even though I'm not going to be able to cover the entire chapter this morning, that I hope that you will take the time this week to fill in all the gaps that time does not allow us to be able to put under the microscope. But this storm is really, really bad. It's one of the worst ones recorded in all of the New Testament. And they try everything that they possibly can to stave it off. And when it gets worse and worse, they start throwing away their cargo. They start throwing away everything overboard just to make it, just to, make it to shore, just to make it to land. Nothing's working. And a lot of us, when it comes to our circumstances, a lot of us have done a lot of things from the internal. We've tried everything that we know to do. A lot of us have sat around the table with someone else and say, I don't, I don't really know what else to do. I've done everything that I know to do concerning X, Y, and Z. I don't know what else to do. Well, you're in the same boat, literally and figuratively, as these 200 plus souls. It's so bad that Luke will record in Acts 27, in the latter half of verse 20, that all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. We held out hope. We held out hope. We held out hope. We're hanging, we're hanging, we're hanging, we're doing, we're trying to be as optimistic, we're doing everything that we can, and after we've taken matters, and after we've looked at it, it's still bad. The only thing for us to do was to abandon hope. That was, that was all that was left, and that's what we did. That's what we did. The storm was so bad that at the end of the chapter, the ship that everybody is on, actually runs aground. This is a shipwreck. It's in the middle of winter. Everybody's cold. Everybody's wet. Everybody's hungry. Everybody's hopeless. And the list could go on and on in how we want to describe it. This is a bad, bad, bad situation. And yet this man will write just a few years later, give thanks in all circumstances. And that's exactly what he does. When he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God. In the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat it. He knows this isn't going to end well. He knows we are hopeless, we are powerless. He knows. There is nothing else that we can take into our hands. We can't take matters into our hands and fix it. There's no fixing this. There's no jumping outside of the ship and finding some better circumstance. And yet he takes the time to give thanks in these circumstances. How? How does this man, with all that that's happening... And by the way, it's Paul who's giving thanks. No one else in this verse, no one else is giving thanks, but he's doing it in the presence of all. How can he give thanks when everything is just awful? I wonder if he struggled to give thanks. I'm sure the others struggled to give thanks. What did he do? How was he able to take just a measly piece of bread Bless it, give thanks for it, and then eat it. How can we do that when things are probably not as well as we want them to be? Things are not as well as we have been praying for them to be. 
And things are not going to be well for a very long time. Because for some of us, it's just a new normal. How can we take food today, much less in a few days, that will be considered Thanksgiving Day, bless it and give thanks in circumstances that it's very hard to be grateful? The first thing that Paul does is that he doesn't look to himself. He reaches back and he notices what God has to say to him. In Acts 27 and verse 23, Paul will say this, that this very night stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. I want you to notice two things from just this one verse. The first thing that Paul does is that he does not root himself nor does he give himself over to the circumstance. He doesn't give himself to the winds that are blowing, the waves that are tossing. He doesn't give himself even to everybody else who is abandoning hope. He's not giving himself over to that. He's refusing. But he's not banking on himself. He is looking to God and he's looking specifically to a message that God has given him. Do you know how powerful the word that you hold in your hands truly is? Do you know how powerful it is in any and all circumstances? Our theme for this year has been that we want to live the Word of God. We don't want to read it with our eyes. We don't want to just hear it with our ears. We actually want to take it into our heart and live according to its truth. No storm is strong enough to take away the Word of God that you hide in your heart. No storm. No circumstance, no matter how unfavorable and no matter how much it may usher in a new normal for you and your family, no storm, no amount of wind, no amount of rain, no amount of circumstances that are beyond your control can take away what God has written down that you hold in your hands. This is why, going back to last Sunday night, if you were able to join us, This is why you let the word of Christ dwell within you richly. That's what Paul says in Colossians 3. Because when everything else is gone, you have the word of God that is true, that is powerful, and that is living. So Psalm 119, we know verse 105 is actually the most famous verse of the entire chapter. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. But I like what the psalmist had to say just two verses later. On one hand, I am severely afflicted. Give me life. Give me life according to your word. You want thankfulness and gratefulness and gratitude to be reignited? To be able to overcome the struggle or whatever the circumstance may be? You turn to the word of God and it will give life to your gratefulness and your thankfulness. It will give life to gratitude. If you plant yourself firmly in God's word, it doesn't matter what else is going on. That is the anchor that will always hold you and keep you grounded. But a lot of us grew up hearing this statement. We don't need to just own a Bible. We need to read it. Owning a Bible isn't going to do us any good. As long as it stays closed. And owning a Bible and even actually reading it is not going to do us any good if we don't have ears to hear and a heart to receive what he's saying. Paul heard that. And he received it. And there was a reminder that he had when he said, going back to that verse, not only have I heard this message of the angel that uh, belongs to God that he gave me, but there's something I was reminded of that. I belong to God. Does he really belong to the centurion who put chains on his wrist? Does he belong as a prisoner on a ship? Does he belong to the circumstances that are beyond his uh, his control? Or does he belong to someone who is greater than all of those? Who do you belong to? If you're a Christian, you belong to God. That same chapter that we looked at last Sunday night in Colossians 3 will tell us just in the early parts of that chapter that if we have been buried with Christ, raised with Christ, then our life is hidden in Christ. Colossians 3 and verse 3. If your life is hidden, he's your safety, uh, your security box that you have in a bank. Most secure place that you have. He's your safety and your security. 
your life, if you are a Christian, if you have responded in faith and repentance and confession and baptism, put your full trust in Him, God took your life, your spiritual life, and put it in a safety deposit box named Jesus. Nothing can touch you. Oh, you may have bumps and bruises, you may have scars. Who doesn't? Jesus did not live life on this earth without scars. But because he knows God, and because he belonged to God, he came through. And you can do the same. Paul will also say, not only did I have this message, and not only did it remind me that I belong to God, but it also produced something. Paul will tell the group, he will tell the entire ship, in verse 22 and in verse 25, take heart. You see that? It's repeated twice. Take heart, take heart. If you're writing in the margin of your Bible or if you're taking notes, be courageous in the face of all of this. I know it would be easy to give up and to give in. I know it would be easy to just simply abandon all hope literally and just say, we're going to just deal with it. And if we perish, we perish. And Paul says, you take heart. You have courage. And notice at the end of verse 36, at the beginning of verse 36, they were all encouraged. But those are not the two things I want to highlight. I want to highlight what's in the middle. For I have faith in God, he says. You want six powerful words for you and your life and you and your family and for us as a congregation? I have, for I have faith in God. They look to themselves first and they let themselves down. They look to each other and they were all powerless to stop and to help one another. When they finally put their eyes and their hearts and their minds and everything that made them, uh, made them who they were in the face of all of this, when they finally gave themselves over to God, they found exactly what they needed to be able to make it through. Courage, bravery, persistence, perseverance. They are all products and fruits of when we go through struggle. But one of the greatest rewards... As hard as it may be, one of the greatest pieces of fruit that comes out of struggle and affliction is a deeper and greater and more abiding faith. But we have to make a choice in the middle of all of that. Do I continue to take matters in my own hands, throwing things over the, overboard? Do I continue to trust in other people? Or do I finally, finally make the decision that I should have made all along to have faith in God? That's where we all are. And that's what every day is. Every day is, when it begins, the most important question will not be what I will eat, where we will go, what do we have to do, what do we need to accomplish. The most important question for the Christian facing every brand new day is, will I have faith in God or not? You have faith in God, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. If you have faith in God, even when it doesn't make sense, and you know it here, but you don't know it here. It catches up and it forms the bridge. It's able to give birth to gratefulness and gratitude. Faith in God doesn't always stop the storm. Some storms that Paul found himself in were stopped. Some affliction and some suffering and some circumstances that were terrible, he found himself delivered from. It's a good time to remind us that we don't need to look to our faith and then get disappointed when God doesn't stop the storm. He doesn't promise to stop the storm. He doesn't promise to keep us from shipwrecking sometimes. Paul, I would imagine, prayed for it to not happen. I would imagine that others didn't want it to happen. But the shipwreck happened. It's okay. Do you know this? The greatest shipwreck of them all, when Jesus was unjustly arrested unfairly tried and crucified on a cross from a human point of view in the most unjust of ways, the shipwreck still happened. And you know what God did three days later? That's why we're here to celebrate. He resurrected him on the first day of the week. This is why Paul will say in the second letter to the Corinthian church, when everything is, is burned away by the struggle and the storms and whatever else, it's all washed away and it's just... It's just you, your family, whatever the circumstance is. This decision. Will you hope? Will you trust? And whatever else? 
Or you be like what he says here, that on God we have set our hope. Jesus set his hope. And he, would, he was not left disappointed. He was not abandoned in the grave. His body did not see decay. He was resurrected three days later. It's on him that we set our hope. Because the resurrection is going to put everything that's wrong right. It's going to wipe away every unfavorable circumstance. When the time comes, God will do what is right and fair, good and true. We know this because he did it for his son. What we need to do sometimes is to hold on by faith. Yes, the shipwreck may happen. And yes, it may not. That's not for us to decide. What is for us to decide is will we continue to trust and put our hope on Him. I mentioned it a few weeks ago. Everybody who did this, everybody who did this in the gospel accounts, who when they were confronted with a decision like yours or mine, they never walked away disappointed. But when they took matters in their own hands and they realized it wasn't enough, from a human point of view, they had to abandon all hope. You put yourself in his hands, there's no such thing as abandoning hope. So the good news of the entire storm isn't that the shipwreck happened, isn't any of those things, is that they were all brought safely to land. They're brought safely to land. It's just a good old-fashioned reminder that God keeps his word. And sometimes what gives birth to gratefulness and thankfulness is if we'll just stop for a moment and reflect and remember when and where God has kept his word this calendar year. When has he kept his word? When was the last time we sat down, pen and paper, spouse, children, friend, brother and sister in Christ, whomever. And when did we actually sit down and said, I know a lot of people this year let us down, because that's what humans do, because we're human beings. Let's sit here and focus on when God did not let us down. He promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us, so let's identify when that promise came true. He said that I would provide a peace that surpasses all understanding, that would guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's identify Let's look back at whatever the circumstance was and identify the peace that only He provides. Maybe the promise isn't going in the past, but perhaps the promise is going in the future. That whatever has been lost in this life can be reclaimed in Christ in the future. The best is yet to come. The end of the day, all circumstances are temporary. Christ is eternal. This is why we love Him. This is why we trust Him. This is why we follow Him. If we can do that, whether we have a measly piece of bread, like Paul did on a ship, or we have a full table of favorite food, we can stop and we can give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. Pray with me. Father, we thank you. We thank you for everything you do for us. And we are most thankful that you are a God who is above everything. And you have set your son as the authority in heaven and on earth. And he is the ruler. And as your word says that he continues to reign and he continues to rule until all things are subject to him. And then when that time comes, he will hand over everything back to you. Father, we pray that until that happens, that one of the things that we will be able to develop in our heart and our mind is a continual spirit, not just feeling, but a spirit and a reality of thankfulness and gratefulness. And we are thankful for your word that stands the test of time. And we are thankful that you saw fit throughout the years to have it written down that is full of unity, it's full of truth. And in cases like this, no matter the circumstances, it is living and it's powerful and it can remind us it can reassure us, and it can reignite thankfulness and gratefulness in our hearts. We are most thankful for Christ, because in Him we find every attitude and every spirit 
and every blessing in Him. To be in Him is to have full access to you. Anyone who is outside of you does not have full access. And yet you desire everyone to come. Father, may we always reflect that the greatest blessing and the greatest source of our gratefulness is that Jesus was born, He lived, He died, and He was resurrected three days later. On this is our hope, and on this is our trust. It's in His name we pray. Amen. If you're not a Christian, we want to encourage you to respond to the good news of Jesus. As was stated, and as many of us know, every blessing that we spoke of today is only found in Christ. But the greatest blessing to leave here today will not be a full plate of food. It will not be a car that has a full tank of gas. The greatest blessing is to know that we have been forgiven of any and all of our sin and to be at peace with God. Only because of Jesus can we be at peace with ourselves and most importantly with God. Our sin makes us enemies and it makes us at enmity with God, odds with Him. But in His love, He sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law at the right time, at the right place. If you need to respond in faith and repentance and baptism this morning, we want to encourage you to do so. If we can help you in any other way, why don't you come as we stand and as we sing?